Yeah, it was good too. Ignacio, we have no audio from your end. We cannot hear music or you. Oh, now we can. Broadcasting in five, four, three, Two, Good evening uh, and welcome to the weekly University of Miami Skull Base and Cerebrovascular Thursday Symposium. Uh, this is now number 16 in a series. Welcome all. Um, I'm Jacques Morcos, Professor and Co-Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and ENT and Director of Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Surgery. And it's my pleasure as it is every week to be with my co-directors of this course, uh, Carolina Benjamin, uh, director of Keynes Lab uh, here at the University of Miami, specializing in brain tumor and skull-based surgery, as well as Michael Ivan, assistant professor, director of research, University of Miami Brain Tumor Initiative, specializing in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular, open vascular colleagues, Robert Stark and Eric Peterson, uh, co-directors of endovascular neurosurgery. Miami, you, hopefully most of you by now, if you are recurrent customers, you know our uh, wonderful center. We have two main hospitals, University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital. We're a high volume tertiary referral center. Uh, we started this back May 21. You can see the series of lectures we have done. All of these have happened already. We are down here today. We have one more to go uh, on the original program, but I am working on finalizing a program that will take us into December. So look out for that on our website. Uh, some housekeeping instructions for the audience. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your window. Type in your questions anytime you like during the whole session. 
and after all the speakers and panelists have spoken we're going to go over them that's that probably the best part of the evening is to answer your questions and get our panelists and speakers to debate we don't offer cmes uh, if you like our sessions please share the links and the programs with your colleagues on your own social media i will try to keep our two speakers to about 25 minutes each i might give them a little warning if they run significantly over uh, write to me please if you have any topics or speakers in cerebrovascular and skull base you would like to hear from and i'm happy to consider all requests as i am still building the program into december my you can see my email i'm also on twitter uh, next week we have a fantastic a session on cordomas of the clivus and craniovertebral junction with Sebastien Frolic from Paris and Jim Evans from here. So uh, it'll be selection of approach and results of a large clinical series for uh, Sebastien Frolic and Jim Evans will talk about lessons learned in endoscopic and endonasal approaches. We have a spectacular panelist, our own Carolina Benjamin, as well as Jose Landero from Brazil. Eric Mellon, our own radiation oncologist, and Gelare Zade from the University of Toronto. So please tune in if you're interested in the topic. And as you also probably know, my partner Mike Ivan has a very successful Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium every Wednesday. And next week uh, is Manish Agi, next Wednesday, September 9, same time, 5 p.m. Miami time. Uh, Anish, uh, Manish will talk about a primer on Cushing disease for neurosurgeons. So please make sure you join us. Thank you to the great team, our University of Miami team that makes it happen. Ingrid, Roberto, Cristina, and particularly Ignacio who runs this webinar every week. Here is a link at the top in case you want to watch previously recorded sessions or to see what's coming up with our many educational offerings a bunch of emails you can see feel free to email for questions you see me on twitter you see our departmental instagram or our departmental twitter as well so let me introduce our great panelists today so first we have peter nakaji professor and chair of neurosurgery at banner university medical center in phoenix arizona uh, peter moved relatively recently after several years at the BNI. I've known Peter since he was a fellow at the BNI, and uh, Peter has made tremendous work and tremendous contributions to both cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery and intraaxial endoscopic brain tumor surgery, and of course has several publications particularly pertaining with his book uh, on uh, brainstem. So, uh, which is of course one of the reasons he's here today. Thanks Peter for joining. Nicholas Bembakidis, professor of neurosurgery at UH Cleveland Medical Center, Cleveland, Ohio. The first thing we should tell Nick is hopefully, uh, congratulations, uh, hopefully, although it's not quite official, but he is uh, of course very likely to be this current, the upcoming CNS president elect. Hopefully we'll know officially in a week or so. And Nick again, uh, 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 has had, uh, not has had, has skull base and cerebrovascular huge expertise and has had an interest in brainstem lesions. Last but not least, Oliver Bozinov, my friend for many years, who also moved recently uh, from Zurich to become professor of neurosurgery and the head at Canton Spital St. Gallen, St. Gallen in Switzerland. And uh, Oliver, Again, besides having a very successful uh, course every January that he's held with a very catchy title, Brainstorm on Brainstem, where he discusses the very topic we're talking about today. So of course, Oliver is a very accomplished cerebrovascular and skull base neurosurgeon with, again, a particular interest and expertise in brainstem lesions, including brainstem cavernomas. On to my two speakers for today. Paolo Cadri, adjunct professor of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul in Campo Grande in Brazil. Uh, Paolo 
has done his MD and residency at the Federal University Sao Paulo, UNIFEST, done a fellowship uh, with the great Sam El Mefti in microneurosurgery and skull base when Sam was at the university in Little Rock almost 16 to 18 years ago, and of course has returned many times and has kept a very close relationship to Dr. El Mefti. He, he, for many years, has done, has run, Paolo has run the St. Louis skull base approaches, microscopic, endoscopic. Paolo is a spectacular teacher. You can see him here in the lab. And this is, I didn't realize till I looked it up uh, earlier today, the symbol of uh, his, where he is now. And I cannot stop but think of the analogy in fiber track dissections. I wonder if it has anything to do with why uh, Paolo is particularly spectacular at anatomical dissections of the brainstem like these uh, fiber tracks. So Paolo, we're very excited to hear you talk about uh, the anatomy of the brainstem. And last but not least, my friend for many years, Kazuhiro Hongo, MD, PhD, currently director of Ina Central Hospital. He is professor emeritus of Chinchu University in Japan, where he had has had a spectacular career to go back to his uh, original training, MD and residency at Chinshu. He did a fellowship in pharmacology and then a research fellowship with, uh, many of you will recognize the picture on the right, uh, Neil Cassell at UVA. And Kazuhiro was there in 1986 working in cerebrovascular with Neil Cassell. Uh, of course, a uh, long career as professor and chair at Chinshu past president of Academia Eurasiana Neurochirurgica and many other awards. I don't have room to list here. His specific interests have been and continue to be cerebrovascular, skull base, brainstem, and also surgical robotics. And this is a picture of the hospital that where he is at, uh, uh, where he is a director currently, Ina Central Hospital. So that's the end of my introduction. And now I'm going to stop sharing the slides. I'm going to invite Paolo to share his screen, unmute his microphone, and please start your presentation. And welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marcos, for this kind of introduction. It was really a pleasure for me to be here. Are you seeing my slides now? You need to go presentation mode. Hit yes. presentation mode. Yes, you got it now. Perfect. Okay. So coming back again, thank you so much. It is in these difficult times, it's always good to have some science moment, I would say. So it's really very important for me to be part of this uh, webinar. About this culture, actually, the, the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul is well known for computers. So the analogy they made was actually about wires and connections, not really about the brain. But I will point out this in the next concil, because really never drove my attention on that. But it is quite see, a see how you analogy. see how useful it is to do course uh, courses with me. I told you, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. So we're gonna try to synthesize the brainstem anatomy in 25 minutes. And one of the very important points that I want to do or to say to you is that I did have the opportunity to do it in my fellowship in Europe to follow Professor Yashargi. And he always stressed a lot about the anatomy, the microanatomy. He pointed that he used the knowledge that he got through the dissections that he did he did a lot of fiber dissection during his medical student and residence time. And he synthesized this time that we should pass in the lab during our training. And in this time, you're gonna see that anatomy, it's only one of the points that he made during the whole training not only the laboratory training, but during our neurosurgical life training. So 
we do have to rely a lot in the anatomy that we see, that we know, but also in what we don't know and also paying very much attention on the pathological anatomy, because this will distort, this will push um, the main uh, anatomical structures away. So it's very important for us to have the microanatomic anatomy, uh, but also we do have to understand that it is not the only key for us to do the surgical approach. So going back to our to our business here, we know that the brain stem is a very old part of the brain. You do have white matter outside. All the time that you see this with the CNS, you're gonna see that you are close to an old phylogenetically part of the brain. So you have white matter outside. We can divide this tail of the brain in three main portions that are derivative from the primordial vesicles. So as you know, the midbrain or the mesencephalon, the pons and the medulla oblonga. If you go after the anatomy, the pure anatomy, you're gonna see that the easiest way to understand this structure that we start from the lower part and going up. Because then you're gonna get more and more uh, strutalized and more new formation and structures coming out from the basic spinal cord. But we as neurosurgeons, we always start in discussing from above, from the midbrain down towards the medulla oblongata. So since this is not a pure neuroanatomical lecture, we're gonna start from above. So here we can see the mesencephalo. As you know, the mesencephalo has a superior unit that is the optic tract. Seen from the lateral surface, it's very well demarcated on the lateral surface, the pontal mesencephalic sulcus, as well as the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. So this will divide the mesencephalo from the lateral surface in a superior limit, an inferior limit, and an anterior portion and a posterior portion. Now, this anterior portion, we're gonna see that it's related to what we call the pedunculus. The peduncle or pedunculus is mainly the anterior portion, while the posterior portion we call the tectum. If we see it from anterior, we're gonna see that the peduncles on each side, they made a valley. This valley also called the fossa between the peduncles, so the interpeduncular fossa, has also the lower limit, the foramen secundus, the superior foramen secundus. And the upper portion is the lower representation of the hypothalamus, the ventral diencephalus. We're gonna very markedly see that the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve, come out from this fossa, but not really from the middle, instead of it from another sulcus that we call the medial mesencephalic sulcus or the oculomotor sulcus. Between those uh, nerves, we do have a lot of entry points of the perforator, the thalamic perforator arteries. Then we're gonna see the representation of the peduncle on the surface, anterior and lateral surfaces. Posteriorly, what we call the tectum. We have a plate formed by four tubercles or colliculi. Those are the quadrigeminal plate that we're gonna go back later on. So if we see an axial cut of the mesencephalo, it can be divided in both parts. And we do have to see those to better understand the distribution of the structures. If we pass a line passing through the aqueduct, we're gonna divide it in an anterior portion or the peduncle and a posterior portion that we tell or we call the tectum. This anterior portion, we can further divide it by the grayish substance, the gray matter of the substantia nigra, which we know that is an interposite, interpositor nuclei between the extra pyramidal and the cerebellum relays. 
So we do have a base and what we call the tegmento. The tegmento is the so-called the cover. It's englobing, it's covering the aqueduct. In the base, all of the fibers are going down at the level of the mesencephalus. Within the tegmento, you're going to have different nuclei and mainly ascending fibers and decussation fibers. When we go to the base, we know that we can further divide it in five, four, or even three portions. But what we do really know is that the main fibers that are descending from the precentral cortex, the cortical spinal tract, they occupy the center of the mesencephalus, the center of the base. On the very middle portion, we do have fibers coming toward, for, uh, towards the frontal lobe to, re, to make the transition or the relay within the pons. So they are the frontal pontines. And of the very lateral portion, we do have the temporal, occipital, and parietal pontine fibers. Now here we can see in this dissection, the continuation of the descending fiber, the projection fibers, that gonna come from the cortex towards the brainstem, towards the spinal cord. We can see here the superior limit, they are retracted, and we can imagine more or less where is supposed to be the cortical spinal tract. Why do I say more or less? Because really we cannot follow fiber by fiber towards the pyramids with the medulla. We do know that if we start our dissection within the medulla and go up, it's easier. And I'm gonna show some of the, the structures also to you. In the tegmental, what will really grab our attention is what we call the neck nucleus, red nucleus, and the substantia nigra. So all the important structures that we're going to see are the ascending fibers that we call, because they are distributed like a strip, laminuscus. So lateral to the red nucleus, we're going to see what we call the laminisci field. We also know that we have important uh, motor fibers of the nuclei of the the nerve, the cranial nerves, such as the third one that is mainly at the level of the upper colliculi. I don't have a cut of the lower colliculi, but we know that the fourth nerve is that situated at the level of the lower colliculi. It's the only one that will cross and have its origin on the dorsal view of the mesencephalus, or actually the whole brain stem. So in here, if I remove only the descending fibers, I'm gonna see the substantia nigra. It's like a shield, it's like a wall, extending from the very medial mesencephalic sulcus all the way towards the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. If I go deeper, now enter, because I just passed the base of the peduncle, so I'm going inside the tegmentum of the mesencephalus. I'm going to see the very pronounced red nucleus on the upper part. On the upper part of the mesencephalus, which the border is not really clear with the called subthalamic area, we have the red nucleus. Red nucleus that is not that big, it is actually a small nucleus, but that do have a lot of connections. That's why it appears at a big brown structure at the very middle of the tegument. One of the most important also things is that below the red nucleus, we do have a very dense white matter field that's gonna be composed by mainly the decussation of the superior cerebellar pedum. Other structure that we do know that is very important in the mesencephalus coming out from the periaqueductal area, just in front actually of the periaqueductal area, passing through the red nucleus to emerge 
on the interpeduncular fossa, on the lateral portion of the interpeduncular fossa, is the third nerve. Third nerve that, as you know, has strong connections, strong connections with the other cranial nerves through the medial longitudinal fascia. So here, if you can see the representation of the aqueduct, what we imagine, because we can see a grab or a, 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 a clutch of gray matter during the dissections, just in front of the periaqueductal gray matter, that we assume that at the level of the superior curricular, what we are seeing is the, uh, the oculomotor nucleus. And then we do know not just in front of it, the other big mass of gray matter that we see is the red nucleus. So here we can imagine the fibers of the third nerve passing through medially, but also through the red nucleus to emerge in the independent fossa. While the longitudinal fasco, the medial longitudinal fasco, which we do know the main connection is with the sixth nerve on the upper floor of our fourth nerve. One thing to pay attention as in ascending fibers is what we call the medial laminiscus. That's as you know, it's coming from the cuneiform in gracia tubercle on the lower portion of the medulla, but on the, its dorsal portion. So it is gonna decussate in the lower part of the medulla and then ascending posterior to the pons and posterior to the uh, substantia nigra, but just in front of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Superior cerebellar peduncle that we can assume is the division and the tegmental of the mesencephalon with the pons. So just underneath the red nucleus, we're gonna see the marked decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Superior cerebellar peduncle that has its main origin within the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum. We know that most of its fibers will ascend towards the transition of the pons and mesencephalon, and the medial fibers will cross towards the other red nucleus. So that's where we found the decussation of the cerebellar peduncle within the lower portion of the mesencephalon and also making like a transition between what is the pons and what is the mesencephalon inside. Now, if we pay our attention posterior to the lateral mesencephalic circles, where we can main find on the surface, the superior cerebellar peduncle, and on top of it, crowning it, we do have the colliculi, the inferior colliculi. If we remove the ependema and try to trace those fibers, we're gonna see the dentate nucleus, the hylos of the dentate nucleus going up. It is transverse and we're gonna see later if we have time by the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And then we will have fibers that are coming through the pons towards the inferior colicula. So this is the acoustic radiation this is the lateral lemniscus. Again, lemniscus means strip. So that's the lateral lemniscus going towards the inferior quadrigeminal uh, colliculus. Superior to it, we have the tectum, the upper colliculi. Tectum is actually superior and inferior colliculi. But we have the upper colliculi. And we do have a band of fibers that are coming from the superior colliculi towards the tegmental of the pons. So this is the so-called tectum tegmental uh, tract. This is gonna be involved also with the movement of the head and also uh, the eyes, the head and eye movement integration. If I remove now the descending fibers, or it means the frontal pontine, the cortical pontine, and posterior fifth of the uh, base of the peduncle. I'm seeing here the shadow of the grayish substance, the substantia nigra, extending from the medial towards the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. And I'm seeing also, so the ascending fibers. So that is the lemniscal stripe. 
from lateral to medial, we're going to see the lateral uh, <clears throat> laminisco, the spinal laminiscus, which is composed by the anterior and lateral spinal thalamic tracts that they will grab together lateral to the medial main laminisco at the level of the mesencephal. And on the very medial, we have the trigeminal laminiscus, because you do have to imagine that also the trigeminal fibers, the sensitive trigeminal fibers, they are decussating within the lower half and also through the entire mesencephal. So this will further go up and go mainly to the ventral portion, posterior ventral portion of the thalamus. Now, it has these very concave curves, the laminiscus, all of them, with the exception of the lateral, because they are pushed backwards by the transverse fibers of the pons. We're going to discuss about that now. Pons, which we do call pons because they are bridges of fibers between wings, one cerebellum and the other. Just it came out of the order. I might have been playing with that. So this is the tectum plate. We do have a crossing uh, sulcus, the transverse and the longitudinal crossing separate the ventricles. And here we have the triangle, subpineal triangle, where we do have some fibers emanating, especially through the abenola, also making connections with the tectum. It is just for us to try to follow those superior and inferior colliculi. We do know that you have the inferior brachium that we can further follow towards the lateral geniculate body. Sorry, the medial geniculate body in the superior brachium that we cannot really follow it because it's passing through the inferior going to the lateral geniculate body. And then further up from the medial and lateral geniculate body, if we can follow those fibers, we can see the acoustic radiation. While, as you imagine, in the lateral geniculate body, we have the optical radiation. But this is another shaft. Now, if we go to the pons, the superior limit of the pons, we know is the pontomesencephalic sulcus. The inferior limit, we know it's the medullo mesencephalic, uh, uh, medullo pontine sulcus. On the lateral limit, we have an arbitrary limit that is the exit or the apparent emergence of the fifth cranial nerve. It's very practical because we know that posterior to it, or lateral to it, we don't have any nuclei. We only have the fibers, transverse fibers of the middle cerebellar pedal. Medially to it, we're going to find the structures that are uh, pontine structures where we do have grayish substance with also, if you the anterior portion of the pons, you have a depression that's so called the basilar sulcus. Most of the time, you're going to find the basilar impression with that. So, coming back here now to the transverse pontine fibers, it's called pons because it's a bridge between the two cerebellums. You do have a very superficial portion, that's the so called superficial transverse pontine fibers. Then you do have the middle portion in the very deep or inner portion that the internal transverse fibers. We're going to see that these internal transverse fibers are made of the acoustic radiation that are very dense in this portion of the pons that even made a structure that we call the trapezoid body. Posterior to the base of the pons, then we do have the tegmentum of the pons, where we're going to find motor nuclei, mixed nuclei with sensory and motor nuclei of the, <clears throat> of the cranial nerves. And we're going to also find some ascending portions. So here we can follow the cerebellar, the middle cerebellar peduncle through the pons. We're going to see that the middle cerebellar peduncle is mainly coming from the neocerebellar cortex. Middle cerebellar peduncle mainly coming from the male cerebellar cortex. We can divide in a superior portion, superior to the entry point of the fifth nerve, and an inferior portion, inferior to the entry point of the fifth nerve. Uh, again, fifth nerve, if we trace a parallel with the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, 
it's also a good reference for us whenever we are dealing with the lesions that are coming towards the surface. Now, if I remove the middle cerebellar pedum, if I remove these transverse pontine fibers, then I'm going to see the so-called longitudinal or, trans or descending and ascending fiber, the long track. We can follow the middle of the mesencephal, the pedunculae, going towards the amygdala. So we can imagine, because of course we cannot trace, at least with the gross anatomy, with the fiber dissection, one fiber and making sure that it's not in a, uh, a relay within any pontine nuclei. But we can assume that the very middle of this descending fibers are going to form the anterior portion with the medulla, which is the parent. Again, we can see the lateral mesencephalic circles trace a line towards the trigeminal nerve emergency. We know that everything that's posterior to it are mainly going now towards the tectum, while the things that are anterior to it might be going also towards the thalamus or towards the red nucleus that also do a lot of connections with the cerebellum and pontine nucleus. Now, if we try again here to follow those fibers going towards the pyramid, we know that around the entry point or the emergency of the five cranial nerve, we do have a space in this space some people want to call this as the uh, safe entry zone, the peritrageminal entry zone. They even divide it in a more superior and inferior, especially the point between the emergence of the seven and eight and the five as a safe entry zone towards the mesencephalus. Of course, it is safe if we consider the cortical spinal tract because it's really located more middle and it's converging towards the pyramids. But we do have to imagine that deep in this region, we have the trigeminal nuclei, as well as the corridor, the strip made by the leminiscal uh, structures. So this is the so-called safety peritrigeminal zone. In this dissection here, now we are seeing the same structure but from its medial aspect. I can see, I remove the very superficial transverse fibers of the pons. Here are the middle, the intermediate, with the fibers will intermingle, we cross with the fibers that are descending, fibers those that if they connect it, they pass through all the pontine structures, they will condense towards the pyramids, which is anterior to the olive. Olive here was removed coming just medial and anterior to the olive, then you have the ascending fibers of the medial uh, lemniscus, okay? The ascending fibers of the lemniscus. You can see here that the deep transverse fibers of the, the pons, they make this very dense packet structure that we call the trapezoid body which are mainly formed by the decussation of the eighth cranial nerve towards the inferior colliculi, one portion, and also towards the other nuclei, the contralateral nuclei on the other portion. So here again, just seeing the very superficial transverse, the middle layer of the transverse pontine and the trapezoid body more posterior, while you have the ascending medial leminiscus made in this very demarcated curve to again join very close to the descending corticospinal tract in close relation to the substantia nigra within the mesenchymal. Here, we can see the descending fibers of the corticospinal tract condensated towards the pyramid. You can see the very superficial layer, transverse pontine layers, and then lateral to the most lateral corticospinal fibers, you're gonna see this space that is marked by the deep transverse pontine fibers 
that they're going to form the trapezoid bond. And here we can see the entry point of the trigeminal nerve, as well as the entry point of the seven and eight cranial nerves that, as we're going to see, they are related to the lateral recess of the fourth cranial nerve. Just a close view of the entry point of the trigeminal nerve. I'm not sure if I do. Do I still have time? Uh, Paolo, if uh, I, I give you a couple more minutes, do you think you could wrap it up in about four minutes? Because I know there's lots of material, which is very important. That can I give, I'll give yeah. you four minutes, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm just try to pass, so, because I knew, I knew we wouldn't have time anyway. So here is just to, to see again the medial lemniscus and the very marked curve that he does posterior to the pulse. Now we can come here towards the medulla. As you know, the medulla has one very marked medium sulcus, which on the surface might sometimes be interrupted. And we can see that this is the lower limit of the medulla. On each side, we're going to have a structure that's the pyramid. As you know, it's the corticospinal tract. And on the top of the pyramid, on the bulbo pontine sulcus or medulla pontine sulcus, we're going to see the emergency of the six cranial nerve. On both sides, lateral and posterior to the pyramids, you do have a protruding structure that is the <clears throat> olive on the superior portion of the medulla, not on the inferior, on the superior portion of the medulla which is formed by the inferior complex, olivary complex. In Hebron, it you have an anterior sulcus, that's the anterior medullary sulcus, or pre-olivary sulcus, and posterior to it, you have the posterior olivary sulcus, or post-olivary sulcus, or lateral, posterior, lateral, medullary sulcus. On the anterior, you have the emergency of the lutus of the 12 cranial nerve. Why? On the upper portion of the olive, you do have a faucet, that's the supraolivary faucet, with the emergence of the seven cranial nerve, and the so-called lateral olivary faucet, where you have the emergence of the eight cranial nerve. Post, on the post-olivary sulcus, you do have the emergence of the nine, ten, and for some, some people believe that the upper roots of the 11 cranial nerve. Now, most of the times, we cannot see the decussation on the surface. If you have a very atrophic brain, you might be able to see on the surface. But most of the times, if you try to follow, you cannot see one point. You're going to see over almost a 10 millimeter, several uh, bundles of fibers crossing. So that is what we consider the lower limit of the medulla and the spinal, or with the spinal cord. Which is very well marked here on the medulla is the development of the inferior olivar uh, complex or inferior olivar nucleus. So it will also trace us a very important parameter because we know that medial to it, we do have the ascending fibers of the lemniscus. Okay? We also know that anterior to it, it's the trigeminal. Just a quick word about the three main structures that connect the cerebellum with the brainstem. So those are the superior, superior cerebellar peduncle, as we can see here. So coming from the hilus of the dentate nucleus and ascending on the posterior portion towards the tectum of the mesencephalon. Then you have the descending inferior cerebellar peduncle that you go towards the lateral portion of the medulla, the lateral portion of the spinal cord. Uh, these are mainly connection of the spine with the so-called spinal portion of the cerebellum, the oldest portion of the cerebellum. Uh, in this point here, is where we have the representation of the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. So now, just to end, if we do the same dissection on the lateral aspect, here we can see the inferior cerebellar peduncle coming posterior to the 
olivary complex to the olive in the medulla. While the superior cerebellar peduncle will ascend towards the mesencephalon. So we will have uh, more time to try to explain the fourth nerve, but this will really take me more than 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm sorry, I could not really condensate everything, but I hope it was useful. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. I mean, um, uh, this is beautiful. And at the very least, you would have stimulated our young people in the audience to go to the lab if they have access to a cadaver lab and try to imitate some of your beautiful dissections. But that should be the starting point. Nobody learns anatomy just by lectures, but this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, did Kazuhiko? I stop sharing? Yes, I did, right? Yes, you did, you did. Professor Hongo, could you yes. share your slides and sure. start your presentation? Let's see how we can now apply this anatomical basis on the surgery of the brain stem, particularly cavernomas. You may want to start on your first slide. Can you see? And yes, can you hear? thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening and uh, good morning here from Japan. I thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Molkus. It's a great uh, honor and pleasure for me uh, to present uh, my work in this session. Well, uh, after a great talk, anatomical talk by Professor Kaduri, I'd like to show uh, the surgical uh, point. Uh, here is my hospital. I'm working right now as Professor Molkus just introduced. Uh, microsurgery for uh, cavernomas uh, is my title today. <clears throat> Nothing to disclose. And well, here is the textbook, uh, Humans and Win. Uh, very fortunate. Uh, one of these uh, volume, vascular session, I'm uh, one of the uh, editor. And in this uh, textbook, uh, here is a summary of surgical indication of uh, cavernomas, cavernous malformation. Uh, and here is brain stem, deep seated splatentorial and brain stem. Uh, with the patient having with uh, repeat hemorrhage with progressive neurological deficit. A uh, good indication for removal. And, <clears throat> but the point is how to select a surgical <clears throat> approach. I think it's uh, very important. Uh, to enter the brainstem uh, from, I think, less, from less eloquent area and uh, from the shallowest point. And also to reach the brainstem with minimal and, or no, actually uh, not no, so minimal damage to the brain parenchyma. It's important. So we need to select the so-called safe entry zone. Uh, there are various uh, uh, articles regarding the safe entry zones. And I think this is uh, one of the very important good paper from BNI, BNI Professor Spetzer just uh, uh, introduced uh, safe entry zone of the midbrain. And here, lateral mesencephalic sulcus and intercurricular region, the midbrain an anterior mesencephalic zone. And how about pons uh, from behind, splacurricular zone, infracurricular zone, and median sulcus. From the median sulcus approach, I think it's a little controversial, but uh, Chris, uh, Spetzler uh, mentioned about this as safe entry zone. And <clears throat> from lateral, <clears throat> as just uh, Professor uh, Kaduri just mentioned splat trigeminal zone, peri trigeminal zone, and lateral trigeminal zone. Uh, these areas are, uh, we can say, safe entry zone. And how about medulla oblongata from <clears throat> lateral, anterolateral sacus, <clears throat> lateral medullary zone, or olivary zone, and a posterior median sacus. 
<clears throat> these are the safe entry zones. But the important thing is to reach, how to reach the safe entry zone to the brainstem, we need to select appropriate surgical approach reaching the brainstem. So we have many options, uh, various approach, uh, including so-called skull-based approaches uh, from any uh, directions. Here's just the uh, list of uh, several types of approaches. Uh, here, seen from lateral, <clears throat> uh, various approaches we need to select uh, according to the vision, extension of the vision, and to avoid the normal structures. Now, uh, here uh, in this presentation, I'd like to uh, share a couple of cases uh, with you. Here, the case of uh, midbrain to thalamus. The case uh, in a 14 year old boy came to us with light hemolysis, and actually, he had a homonymous hemianopia and the vision growing. Uh, so, need to be uh, op treated on the uh, treated op operation needed, surgery needed. So, what kind of approach uh, do you think is better to select? Select it. And I chose. Uh, this approach, palamedian spola transtentorial approach, uh, to avoid uh, the normal sludge damage as uh, much as possible. And here I'd like to show uh, uh, a short video. Here is the patient is placed in a prone position, and here is the skin incision, rather uh, long, but here uh, we call it waved skin incision. It's a, a little tip to hide the scar, even the hair uh, becomes so wet. So the patient is prone and <clears throat> a sub occipital. Uh, here is the cerebellum. So the infra tentorial approach is uh, taken. <clears throat> uh, here we can see the tentorium. And after evacuating the CSF very quickly, and the cerebellum is a little bit uh, uh, retracted downward. And now we can see the, here is the free edge of tentorium. So uh, now I'm cutting the tentorium a little bit uh, to the uh, free edge and remove a little part of the tentorium to see the base uh, near vision. Now we can see the basal vein. The lesion must be behind this. So retracting this uh, vein, deep vein, uh, basal vein laterally, uh, here's medial temporal lobe. Uh, now <clears throat> here, uh, just the brain uh, cortical mapping to see the cortical spine tract. And now here almost uh, near the site of lateral geniculoid body. Uh, making us a uh, small incision in the four or five millimeters. And now we can uh, reach lesion. And uh, once lesion is uh, reached, a micro surgical technique is used with uh, high magnification, remove the lesion meticulously, uh, uh, moving the microscope uh, and seeing the surrounding. Uh, to see uh, no residue is uh, there. A total resection was achieved uh, the way this way. Yeah, <clears throat> incision pop eventually six, seven millimeters. Now here is the post-operative MRI showing a good resection removal of lesion. Uh, here's another uh, lesion. Uh, the patient has multiple lesion. A week later, just before discharge, he uh, was ambulant. Ah, yeah, a little better than before surgery. And yeah, the pain is uh, still he has, but uh, better than before surgery. The pain is uh, hemianopia didn't change. 
Yeah, and um, here is another case of Pontine Legion. A young, boy, a young man uh, came to us with this Alcidian left hand paralysis. The region is almost traversed the Pontine anterior to the posterior, uh, reaching to the fourth ventricle four. And seeing the serial CT scan before admission, now I can find that the initially the region was located uh, more anteriorly. <coughs> so <coughs> what approach uh, did I take? Anterior petrosal approach was taken uh, here from uh, this side. My colleague uh, doing uh, working on the petro petrosal approach, bone working, extra drug working. And here, <coughs> Now here, a uh, trigeminal nerve on the right side. After cortical mapping, uh, I made a small incision here, just very uh, trigeminal uh, area, uh, we can say. A small incision, five, six millimeters. And then uh, once lesion is reached, then microsurgical technique just uh, remove the lesion piece by piece. No need to remove envelope in envelope fashion. Remove a little by little. Dr. Hongo, do you use tractography to decide on the approach or no? Uh, some case I did, not always, not always. So not but, uh, not this one? Not this I, one. No, no, this one. No, this one. Yeah, here after, after a resection is the incision four, five millimeters. <clears throat> yeah, here's the immediate after surgery, post op MRI showing nice, nice removal of the lesion. For the patient uh, before surgery, uh, <clears throat> not ambulant, uh, uh, bedridden, and he, the patient showed severe extraocular movement disturbance, but after surgery, some improved. And uh, hemiparesis uh, improved a little bit, uh, gradually. Well, and here is another case of Ponta Indesian, 23-year-old woman came to us with repeated hemorrhage here. And the indication for surgery, I think it's uh, no problem, need to be operated on. What approach uh, should we take, various approaches? from anterolateral or from behind or lateral. Well, I, I like uh, posterior approach, transverse ventricle approach, but uh, there is some space here. So I selected anterolateral approach is uh, the case uh, before, the same as the case before, anterior petrosal approach here from left side. <laughs> also in this case, uh, we don't, uh, uh, take a tractography. Well, because of the development of vessel of uh, uh, spinal vein, I, my uh, colleagues are uh, working on this uh, epidural procedure. First, entering the interdural space first, then confirm the uh, venous structure with uh, uh, ICG video angiography and then back to the epidural space and remove, do the antipetrosal, petros, petros, apex as needed <coughs> with uh, hyperdural here. Uh, meticulously taking time. Uh, bone, bone curate is also available it's rather safe, safer than do itself. And here is the cortical direct stimulation, cortical mapping. And then here we can see uh, the left trigeminal nerve root entry point long. Just uh, middle inferior, I made uh, incision. The region, uh, I know that region is a bit too deep uh, actually seven to eight millimeters from the surface of the pons. And once the region is reached, uh, the region is removed 
gently piece by piece. <clears throat> and not to have residue using sometimes using the coagulation. And see the whole uh, surface of the parenchyme not to have uh, any residue. Uh, four or five millimeters incision and depth at the deepest uh, 12 millimeters. Now total resection removal was achieved at surgery. And here, uh, post-operative MRI showing the access route here, uh, the 12 millimeters from here to the deepest point. <coughs> and here, uh, the patient post-operative uh, condition uh, just before discharge uh, a week later after surgery, uh, the patient had no hemiparesis. And the point is, uh, how about facial? Facial function, the patient has uh, also no facial function of course, uh, for this patient, the approach was uh, from anterolateral. Until so how about this case? 54-year-old woman uh, came to us with the proper, with repeated hemorrhage here. Not uh, so big, but located very uh, dorsally facing, almost facing to the uh, fourth ventricular floor. And how about uh, approach repeated hemorrhage? So I think we need the surgical indication we have, and the patient agreed to be operated on. So, well, uh, by the way, where to inside the fourth ventricle floor when uh, we go uh, to the brainstem from the fourth ventricular floor? I think uh, this is a very famous paper from my senior colleague, Dr. Kyoshima, I published in Journal of Neurosurgery uh, back 1993. He presented proposed safe ventricle zone as infrafacial triangle and supra-facial triangle. The key point is uh, protect the facial function at least. So uh, thinking of the patient, the uh, post-operative uh, uh, life. <coughs> and here is also another very important article from Professor Bertlanfi the facial nerve, facial colliculus, facial nucleus, as uh, especially facial colliculus uh, as varying depend on the patient. One reason is because of the lesion underlining. So I think the important thing is brainstem mapping uh, as well as monitoring. So this is my colleague, Dr. Dotto. He is uh, also expert neurosurgeon and uh, men, uh, working on brainstem mapping, including various uh, neural monitoring. <clears throat> uh, this is applied to identify the uh, nerve curriculus, facial curriculus, we call it mapping, and then monitoring the nerve function monitoring, as well as other available uh, monitoring. And here is the fourth ventricle for a mapping here. Uh, this is the figure uh, Dr. Kyoshima uh, published. <clears throat> and here to identify the facial colliculus, monopolar electrode was used to locate, to localize the facial colliculus. And then after uh, transcranial motor evoked potential for cranial nerves, uh, cortical uh, <clears throat> stimulation. And now, uh, uh, depending on the uh, point of the stimulation, we can get the uh, laser, not definitely, but we can know the facial muscle function with collaboration of a neuro anesthetologist. <coughs> yeah, here the, the cortical uh, electrode placed. Now we can see the activation of uh, the muscles of the hand, lower lip, and tongue. So and so forth. Now back to that case, uh, 
and now because of uh, the location very close to the fourth ventricle floor i decided i went into from the fourth ventricle floor under meticulous mapping and monitoring here the patient is placed in the plumb position and the surgery <coughs> here uh you can see the other varmies of course without cutting the varmies uh, a terovera or uh, uh, cerebral pump uh, cerebral medullary fissure approach by Matsushima and Lotum. Uh, we can enter, expose the, expose the fourth ventricular floor adequately without incising any neural structures. And now the floor of the fourth ventricle is being exposed here. Uh, here is median sulcus, is the right side, left side is almost hidden, and the lesion is on the, mainly uh, on the right side. Here, first brainstem mapping to localize, locate the facial colliculus with by electrical stimulation. Now here, this area is confirmed to be a facial colliculus. And in this case, uh, uh, Dr. Kiyoshima's spola facial triangle is being cut here, this place. Under the monitoring of continuous facial, transcranial facial evoked potential, <clears throat> I keep in mind not to too much place manipulate this uh, area uh, should be preserved. Here's the cortical uh, facial progress. Now, once the lesion is entered, reached, again, uh, gently and the lesion is uh, removed by piece by piece with coagulation and <clears throat> a cotton wipe method <clears throat> and the high magnification. The important thing is uh, to make sure to remove uh, completely. Sometimes we need to uh, raise the venous pressure with my, a virus of a maneuver asking to the uh, anesthetologist. <clears throat> and here, four or five millimeters after a resection of the lesion. <coughs> here, a post immediate post op CT scan showing removal of the lesion. Uh, a week later, just before uh, discharge in the hospital, no hemiparesis, the patient is ambulant walking smoothly. And how about the facial function? Uh, the patient uh, uh, permitted to be video taken, video. Uh, extraocular movement is good. And no uh, facial palsy not detected. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, uh, I show a couple of cases, mainly on the one brain stem, uh, one midbrain, and others uh, all point in vision. And brain stem, uh, this is kind of some of the brain stem cavernous malformation can be favorably removed with or under knowledge of brain stem anatomy function. An appropriate selection of entry point, precise separation and vision, and electrophysiological monitoring and mapping. <clears throat> and my take home message today is lesion in the ventral middle side of the pons, anterior or anterolateral approach is recommendable. And lesion even in the dorsal side of the pons, anterior or anterolateral approach is still recommendable. But lesion in the pure dorsal side of the pons and still the patient has indication for surgery, transverse ventricular flow approach can be indicated and is rather safely applied with the help of brainstem mapping and monitoring. Without these uh, tools, brainstem mapping and monitoring, I think it's uh, rather uh, unsafe. So for taking an approach from transverse ventricular floor, 
brainstem mapping and monitoring. I think it's quite essential. Uh, this is my uh, presentation for today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Kazuhira, for those beautiful cases, beautiful videos. If you could stop, wonderful, oh, yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I think without wasting any time, I'm just going to get going with the panelist. Peter, you ready to go with your case, perhaps first? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed uh, both the anatomical presentation and the cases uh, very much. And I have to say, I'm very interested in this mapping uh, technique because although we had published before that this is a safe entry zone, I think it's a, a difficult one, the floor. But just like with everything, if you can map, and you know where you're going, uh, it makes it much, much safer. Uh, so let me go ahead and share screen here. Okay. So um, I'm interested in the, the speaker's the thoughts on this. This is a 36 year old woman who presented to me with headache and then progr rapidly progressive swallowing problems and numbness. She, she basically was normal and then started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Uh, and this is the lesion that you see. Maybe you want thoughts Paolo, on maybe the approach Paolo. to this area? Paolo, how would you handle this? Are you muted? Oh, uh, unmute yourselves, everybody, so we can have a conversation. So this is anterior medullary lesion. Cyber yeah, anterior six, medullary and appears to present towards the right side. Yeah. And uh, I will probably first make sure this is not any infectious or inflammatory disease. So this is for sure tumor, right? We don't know, uh, but she's de deteriorating rather rapidly. She doesn't have any history, completely normal. Any and it's rapidly, no, no fever. It's rapidly progressing. Rapidly progressive, no fever, no uh, medical procedures, not immunocompromised, no history of um, really anything else. No, we do have some strange things down here in South. So we do have uh, schistosomas, we do have another kind of parasites. So I would first probably. This, this is take, Phoenix, uh, Arizona. <laughs> yeah. So I'll probably first take a CSF a puncture and see if, if it will show up something. But just discussing, like uh, we do have to enter and do a and do a, a surgical treatment. I mean, for the this region here, a uh, uh, pretty much little little bit more lateral. Posterior fossil with resection of C1, C2, maybe. C1, no, not either C1, C1. I think it, that should be enough. Of course, I do think that monitoring would be very important here. But uh, even portion of part of the lesion seems to be exophic, so should be not difficult to, to approach it. By the way, sorry, Paulo, I think you're. Uh, um... Uh, video is off. I, we can't see you. I can't see you. Are you are you turned off your video? Unless you don't want us. I, I turned on. Maybe. I only we only see your name. We we maybe, don't. Maybe maybe Nasho has to. Yeah, I see. On. I see. I can see him on our, my view, but maybe. Yeah, my camera seems to be on here. And Hongo san. Yes, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, the pathology not yet com uh, confirmed, us, but uh, the progressive, anyway, uh, surgery is needed. So how about approach? So uh, this is anterior medial uh, location of the um, middle of Rungata. So uh, my preferable approach is transchondra fossa or uh, by Professor Matsushima, our extreme lateral uh, Anyway, yeah, from ex uh, from the uh, lateral most part, we can see OIF and uh, just uh, confirming uh, the mapping. Then I think it is not uh, exposing, but so palpating 
that the near the olive uh, eigen center region. Jock, should I just go on to the uh, what, what I did? Do you have other thoughts or maybe our other panelists? Uh, yeah, it is weird looking. I mean, I, we don't have as many weird, uh, strange um, infectious uh, possibilities in Cleveland. So I, I would, you know, think this is some kind of neoplastic process, um, probably rule, trying to rule out lymphoma. But if you're stuck operating for tissue, I agree, probably just do a right far lateral transcondylar approach. It looks partially exophytic, get tissue and see what, see what you end up, end up with. Yeah, I mean, that was my thought too. She was uh, deteriorating a fair amount. There's a, actually a lot of edema that I didn't show the pictures of, um, but we really weren't sure. Um, I have had, you know, brainstem glioblastoma and some other things. So, but also infection was on the list, but if she were really deteriorating, we felt like we had to do something. So um, this is the approach. And in fact, that is the exactly what we did, which was a far lateral approach. And this is, I guess some people would call it a, or an extreme lateral. But I think the key for me is really getting a lot of the condyle out above the articular surface. So you don't, in my view, you don't really have to take the articular surface in a lot of cases. You can leave it almost like a little shoe uh, holding things up. And then that allows you to get most of that reflected anteriorly. Um, we paralyze her here so that she doesn't jump as we move the 11th nerve out of the way and then go down, cut the dentate and just look along the brain stem we know that from where the 12th nerve comes out, we just have to look about where the olive is. And actually, in this case, we see a big bulge. It's not quite um, truly exophytic, uh, but uh, but Paula, you're you're absolutely right because the moment I saw this, I knew what it was. Uh, that uh, and and I was very happy actually because we have a very small amount of neurocysticercosis. She had no travel history and no reason. But as you know, it can happen to anyone. And we find that when they degenerate, sometimes they really swell a lot. And, uh, and we do end up having to take a few of them to surgery. Most of them, of course, are treated medically. But the nice thing is they come out so beautifully because the body basically rejects the whole thing. You contracted That's, that in Arizona? We have, we have, we have cases, not, you know, not as many, um, you know, it's funny if you talk to your colleagues, sometimes in South America or India, they'll tell you they see them a lot, still not that many in the brainstem. Yeah, inside the brainstem like that, uh, I don't remember to see. Yeah, I just, the only point I was going to make about the, um, the approach is, uh, again, I don't think it's necessary to take the entire condyle, and if you leave the articular surface, which you can see on the lower right panel, uh, mostly intact and take everything above it. I actually have not had to fuse people like this. I've known this lady now for many years and she never developed instability and has normal neck motion. Um, so I thought it was an interesting uh, case. Yeah, very nice, very nice. What, I, may, I lost you guys for a second. I lost my Wi-Fi. Did you say what monitoring you were doing? Just SSCP? So we did the full, all the cranial nerve, lower cranial nerve uh, monitoring and SSCPs and motor evoke potentials. Yeah, for that, because it's anterior enough, they think you have to worry about the pyramids in that area. And then yeah. you want 12 and you want 9, 10, 11. But in the end, as we got close, once, once I saw it, and then we actually gave paralytic because, as you know, operating past 11, then the body jumps every time you touch that nerve. So you know, once one, we were there, I, I actually let it go. What one trick I use, I put papaverin on 11th nerve topically. Oh, yeah, and make it stop. Makes it stop and then, then you know, or, or, or do what you're doing, systemic paralysis. Well, that might be better, actually, because when you stop, you do lose the monitoring. Once I right. thought it was neurocystocosis, you didn't worry so much. Yeah, you know, but. yeah. Did you do tratography? Um, you know, and back then, I, this is an older case, I didn't, but I would do it now. I find on this kind of lesion and the GBM and everything, it's actually worked pretty well. I found that on calf mouths, it's not always, if, if there's something close and there's a lot of hemosiderin, it isn't fantastic, um, you know, at least in my, my experience with it. Yeah, I was just curious. I, I don't think it will change anything, but just uh, I was curious yeah. to see. Uh, because yeah. it's important to recall some uh, information on the tractography, especially with this kind of lesion. 
Actually, John, do you mind if I if I show just one quick thing? Yeah, yeah. Also? Go, go, go ahead. Just, um, Sorry, before you go, though, uh, one second before you go, let me read the question from the audience, which is oh, yeah. appropriate time right now. Uh, any of you could answer. Uh, this is from Chazor Onia from somewhere in Africa. I don't know where, but uh, thank you very much for the talk. The question is, it's nice, good and nice to say we need intra-op neuromonitoring, but what would you speakers and panelists recommend to neurosurgeons in countries that have no availability for intra-op monitoring? Any, any advice uh, as alternative to neuromonitoring to ensure safe resection without causing deficits, a apart from good knowledge of the safe entry zones as discussed? But let me start with Dr. Hongo. Dr. Hongo, what would you yes. recommend our of African yeah. colleague yeah, who has thank, no access to monitoring? Yes, thank you for your question. Well, uh, I think there are many countries uh, the monitoring is not available. In that case, I recommend uh, take the approach uh, as much as possible from anterior or anterior approach, even the distance. Reaching distance is long enough but thinking of the possible uh, neuro neurological function, I think uh, anterior or anterolateral approach is uh, more safe uh, in case there is no monitoring. I think from behind, from uh, false ventricular floor, I think it's a uh, high chance of being uh, the facial or other coronary palsy occur after surgery. So would you say, Dr. Hongo, that if the only feasible approach is through the floor of the fourth ventricle for a cavernoma and the neurosurgeon does not have access to intra-op monitoring, they should probably not do the case and try to refer elsewhere? Yeah, yeah, I can say yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I hate the floor of the fourth ventricle. If I have time, I'll show a case at the end. But I, mm -hmm. any, any, any way I, I can... Anything I can do to avoid the floor of the fourth ventricle, I will avoid it. Because, you know, like your last video you showed, you usually you start perfectly suprafacial. And then as the dissection progresses, I mean, your case did great, but I've had cases who have not done great, even though I was not on the colliculus. Just stretching of that colliculus as you resect the lesion, little by little, you damage it. I find myself with a much bigger hole at the end of the case than than at the beginning. And that's, I think, how I heard the facial. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's completely agree. So the continuous monitoring of facial uh, nerve, MEP, is important. And uh, a year ago, my colleagues published uh, the case of monitoring for post ventricular uh, approach in general renal surgery. Spur facial triangle approach is a uh, uh, higher instance of uh, damage of the facial nerve in, uh, comparable, compared with infrafacial from the approach. So this, right. uh, especially the superficial approach is very cautious about uh, the compressing of the facial curriculum. Anybody else from the panel speaker want to answer our African colleague if no monitoring is available? Anything you'd like to say? Yes, Jack, uh, maybe, maybe I can say something. Oliver, go ahead. I want to remind everybody of our big teacher, Robert Spetzler, who made it very simple for everybody. Instead of safe entry zones, he said, take the two point approach, uh, just take the middle of the lesion and there where you want to enter the brainstem, which is of course very uh, simple, but it helps like in Peter's case. Uh, anyway, I think one point which is very important too, when you do want to enter the brainstem without monitoring, I personally very um, recommend to use lateral approaches and not use the midline approaches. I think many devastating cases are coming through midline approaches because if you really do damage, imagine both bilateral uh, function, then you are really in big trouble for the outcome. Yeah, you know, Oliver, the two point method, I mean, even Spetzler and, and you know, most of us, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, it's a nice starting point. But I mean, as you know, that rule is meant to be broken many times in favor of physiology. So I'm, I'm not sure it applies everywhere. And certainly in the fourth ventricle, I, it's almost dangerous to use it. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I know you, I, I know you know what I mean, but uh, yeah. Why we use neuromonitoring? 
Yeah. Any anybody else wants to comment before we let Peter show his second case? I just would say that you know I think it is difficult, but but the first part, which is the knowledge of the anatomy, and then the basic rule, you know, don't turn corners. Um, really respect those areas because you're right. That area in the midline, for instance, is the best example. It's very easy without monitoring to get a facial diplegia or permanent diplopia or one of these more complicated, like one and a half um, type of syndrome. So it's, I think it's a tough place to be. Um, for the pontine area, I agree also though that coming from the side, uh, even though it seems like it's a lot longer distance, is often safer without the monitoring. But I think that. For those of us who might have access to monitoring, we think we, are, we really should be using it. For those who don't have access to it, it does make it much harder unless you're willing to accept a, a pretty bad deficit. Okay, Peter, go ahead with your second. Well, I'll go quick on this one. I just was so interested in, in Professor Hongo's case um, of the lesion in the this posterior uh, thalamus upper midbrain region because I find it one of the most challenging uh, areas, you know, it's almost all these different zones, the thalamus. So I'm just curious, you know, he used this ipsilateral approach, but it feels to me like there's a little bit of a turning of the corner there. Obviously the patient did extremely well. So I think superior technique um, helps, but I'm curious looking at this case, if, if he would do an ipsilateral same posterior approach uh, to this or, or a transventricular approach or some other approach. Dr. Hongo? Yes. Uh, Would you do sweet. the exact same approach on this case as the one you yes, showed? Uh, yes, I know. Uh, there are two options. One option is the approach I just mentioned that the vision is located laterally. So uh, the same approach from the contralateral, I think it's uh, one good option. Uh, a little bit distant, but the uh, very safe uh, dealing with the lateral part of the vision. I think that's my concern. Uh, Nick, how would you do this one, Nick? Yeah, I probably go transventricular posteriorly. I mean, there's no short way to get to this, of course. So everything, anything you do is gonna be challenging, but I'd probably be more comfortable coming from above. What, what do you mean above, like what? Transventricular, maybe. I'd have to look at the sagittal images, but maybe- um, You mean trans? Trans trigonal, or you mean trans third ventricle? Trans third ventricle. <clears throat> Boy, yeah, there was quite a bit of cap on the on the third ventricle. The atrial side would be more. This guy is a working lawyer with a good memory at that at the beginning, so I was very hesitant to come from like the superior parietal lobule transventricular approach. I, I think and, supracerebellar is perfect for the, it's a pulvinar lesion, and at some point. But uh, yeah, I see what you mean, Peter. I mean, I probably would cross, I, I would do paramedian, but obviously the, take the bone flap across the midline. So I've got the option when I'm there. I mean, you know, it's a little cheating, I think, when we talk about contralateral, supracerebellar. It's not the same as contralateral, para, you know, interhemispheric. There is a fault there in the middle. Here, there is nothing in the middle. So being in the midline, you're kind of bilateral to start with. But I, I see what you mean, the angle. I guess, is that what you did? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the principle, um, and Professor Ongo went straight to it, um, is, is exactly right, which is a, a contralateral approach. And the only difference is, as anyone who knows what I'd like to do, it's a, it's a yeah. endoscopic through a keyhole craniotomy from the other side. So I don't make a, my approach doesn't go to the ipsilateral side at all. It just reaches across the midline. So, so I went here. I did take this small vein at the top, and um, and once you do that, you're right. There's nothing in the middle. The vermis falls down because they're in the in the sitting slouch position, and that basically takes you to the other side. And I, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because the video is a little bit long, but you can see as we go and and tease open the area. This is just the junction between the tentorium and the pulvinar on the other side and get in there. So to the left, you can see the lateral ventricle. And so I could look in and see actually the fibers that I was trying to preserve um, uh, for the fornices. And then we just pop into this cavity, which is here. 
and then we're right inside of the tumor at that point going across. And this is, you know, we're using a, obviously not a, a working channel endoscope, but using an endoscope and just sucking away all the soft stuff and just watching, you know, and monitoring uh, the whole time. And it's very clear at that point, because you're right, I've, the contralateral view is actually much better in terms of trajectory. So it's a little bit of a two point method uh, kind of thing too. And here, just watching and providing counter traction. This is something that Spetzer did so well um, was to just put counter traction and, and, you know, pull it out basically. So I won't make you go through the whole thing, but that's the post out. There were these two islands that you can see on the left side on the, the right image that were not contiguous. And I didn't try to take them out because, you know, any intervening thalamus I thought would be bad, but um, he did have, his, his memory was no different after the procedure, but he has gradually been losing his memory as he's had radiation therapy and everything else. Um, great, great point. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Nick, why don't you. we have you next? Okay. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Oliver, you're still awake for us? You, you're ready. You're a neurosurgeon. He's a, of he's a trooper. Who needs well, to speak? It is challenging uh, staying awake through Dr. Nakaji's cases. So <laughs> we can keep people awake now. Since he took most of my time, we'll try and make it up here. So no, uh, don't worry. We'll give you. No one time. wants to hear from you anyway. <laughs> so a quick case. So I think a similar theme. A uh, 10 year old boy with these symptoms, progressive headaches, trouble ambulating, previously healthy, facial numbness on the right, left hemiparesis. Actually had a brain MRI from two years ago showing a pontine DVA, but otherwise normal. And then you can see here, new MRI with this cavernoma, you can see the DVA coming through the pons. So again, this is a new lesion uh, compared to his prior MRI with progressive uh, deficits. Uh, so, and then here's just a quick uh, video. You can just kind of see through the axials, uh, the location of the, uh, uh, of the lesion. You can see there the SCA and then there the PCA. So I guess I would just start by asking if, uh, assuming everybody would treat this microsurgically in this kid, would anybody not treat this surgically? I, 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 if I can jump in, I, I mean, I would really need to be pushed to treat this patient surgically. I would do tractography. And if that, because if I were going to treat it, I would probably personally do subtemporal because it seems that's where it's most superficial. But only if the DT, uh, tractography shows me there is no corticospinal draped lateral to it, I would let it grow further to reach the surface in the future. But uh, I'm interested in the other speakers. Uh, uh, Paolo, how would you, I don't, what's your opinion? I, I would for sure ask for a tractography. And in the case that the lateral window is open, I will do it from the uh, anterior petrosal approach. Why anterior petrosal? Uh, um, Nick, can you go back uh, where you had the coronal? It's, it's like level with the middle fossa on a coronal. What, you don't... You, you know what I'm saying? Look bottom right. It, it, it is a pontine lesion, right? It's a... Uh, well, mesencephalo, I mean, it's junction. Yeah. Yeah, it's mostly pontine, but it does go up into the midbrain somewhat. Yeah, so I, I would prefer to, instead of doing subtemporal, go anterior petrol. Well, I mean, you're doing subtemporal, you, well, but you're still going on the temporal lobe, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. but in the case you're gonna create your window to work with uh, towards the base, right? I, I do have the impression that I don't have to to lift up so much the temporal lobe when I do have when I do the anterior petrosal. That's that's my impression. I will do it anterior petrosal. Um, but I Oliver, think it's also feasible if you do September. Oliver. Yeah. I Subtemper is definitely an option. I don't think as well that you need much of the uh, um, petrosal. But, uh, I would also consider a supracellular uh, trans transpeduncle approach, but I would need some more images. But I would think about that coming from behind. 
Dr. Hongo, how would you do this case? Well, would, what, what would you do with this case, not how? Well, uh, I think subtemporal or antipetrosal, uh, both are options depending on the, as uh, Jack mentioned, the tractal uh, uh, cortical spine tract. If tractography is available, then I'd like to see, but if not, uh, I'd like to know, is this the fast scan? If the initial scan, uh, uh, when the lesion is a little more small, uh, if I can get the scans, uh, we can know the initial he said, lesion. He said there was no lesion except a DVA on the yeah, first. It was, it was totally no, no, normal. Chron chron chronologically, if the patient has previous scan, if uh, we can have the small lesion, medial or lateral, and extending it to the image like this, then we can know uh, might be a medial to the cortical spine tract, or we can know this may be lateral to the cortical spine tract, even we have no tractography. Uh, so, uh, but the, I think lateral approach, lateral subtemporal is, uh, yeah, uh, good option, I think. Uh, Pete, uh, Peter, you're muted. Uh, yeah, Peter, you're still muted. Sorry, I had the chat screen in the way of my button. Uh, um, yeah, I think it really depends where it comes to uh, laterally because I'd be tempted to come that direction and either subtemporal or probably subtemporal. Um, but I also agree, I, I really agree with what Professor Hongo is saying, which is if you can see something from before and you can know where it came from, it really gives you an idea of, of which direction it's opening things up. So it would be nice to see it, but if there's truly nothing there, then I mean, it looks to me like uh, the safest area is that lateral approach. I, I'm interested to see what the uh, presenter did. Would everybody well, think the well, same? comes from the left side. What's that? If the lesion was on the other side, would everybody use subtemporal from the left side the same way or would you be more hesitant? I mean, I'll always be a little more hesitant to do subtemporal from the left side. Well, I mean, do you all, I mean, I use the lumbar drain. Do you not, You do you all use lumbar drain for an intradural subtemporal approach? Or, or I'd love to hear opinions. I guess so. Yeah, pretty pretty much would, pretty yeah. much always. Okay. Okay, Nick, it's yours. Tell well, us. so naturally I didn't do any of that. So uh <laughs> Why <I> actually, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> uh well, because it's a presentation with the panel, so I did something right. different. So I did I did a lateral uh super cerebellar paramedian approach, which I don't do very often. Uh, but in this case, I thought it was a good option. I didn't show you the T2, which showed some of the blooming that uh, showed it coming to the surface uh, laterally. You can see right under the fourth nerve in the SCA is where we uh, chose to make our entry point. Um, and really went very well in terms of uh, resecting the cavernoma. We had a nice exposure. Uh, I think we did use a lumbar drain too, which always helps when you have a kid too with a tight, uh, narrow corridor and a potentially tight brain, uh, but um, in all other respects, uh, we did use obviously motor mapping and the usual um, uh, potential monitoring and the case went very well. And he did, he did really well post-operatively too. His weakness improved uh, over the next uh, few weeks and you can see the post-op MR. So I think the other point too is obviously the DVAs, especially in this case, when they're very large, you have to be aware of them and try try to avoid injuring them during the resection as we've all um, been taught um, by Dr. Spessler over the years is very critical in post-operative outcome. You, you know what, very nice, Nick. You know what I learned with the veins? Yes, DVA, preserve it, but never preserve, the, you know, all of these cavernomas, as you guys know, they have a little tiny draining vein from them into the main DVA, if there's a main DVA. And when I've left that tiny vein thinking it's part of the DVA, I've had two or three recurrences my, um, of, of my cases in the brain stem. And I've gone back and I've noticed the vein. So now I 
always take the vein up to the DVA. You know what I'm saying? Not everything venous should be saved, in my opinion. It's like grapes on a, what do you call it? The, like a branch of, of a grape. You, you really have to take the branch without taking the trunk. That, that's, that's my kind of anecdotal opinion. I don't know. But that's a good case. You, did you have another quick one, Nick? You wanted to? No, no, I, no. Unlike Dr. Nakaji, I listened to what you said and I brought. Uh, hey, one. now. No, but uh, no, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oliver, thank you. Oliver, your turn. Uh, maybe one more question because you mentioned the coagulation. There's always the debate whether it's smart to meticulously coagulate in the brainstem everything to not have a re hemorrhage. And there are other groups who really advocate not to coagulate a lot and to minimize that. So what is the painless opinion on this? Well, that's a good question. I think for, you know, you have limited visualization to begin with, and I'm always paranoid that I'm going to get into sometimes in, in this case, the large DVA. So if you get a little bleeding and it's venous, uh, you know, I, I like to just try and use some hemostatic agents and just kind of get it under control that way, rather than, you know, potentially get into a situation where you're coagulating um, vessels that you don't necessarily want to. So I think that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I think it's a double edge, Oliver, in my opinion. Cautious coagulation buys you space. If you coagulate the mulberry so it shrinks a little bit, you can see a little bit behind it. But yeah, you, I don't want to coagulate to the point where I lose the visible demarcation between the gliotic plane. You know, you want to keep the colors as they are. Uh, so, you know, yeah, judgment call. I mean, after resection, Jack. Oh, oh, sorry. After resection. Uh, no, not much. After resection, I just, I, I try to do what, whatever Spetzler taught me decades ago. Like you tease it and you, you, you know, challenge it and see if it bleeds. If it bleeds, yeah, I will buzz it a little bit. I, oh. What can I say? Yeah, I do use uh, cautery, but not often. Basically, uh, cotton and irrigation. And after resection, no uh, coagulation. Uh, just uh, place the cotton and irrigation and stay a couple of minutes and confirm. And just in case of the active reading, then I do use, but not, not uh, try not to use cautery quite often. It's my uh, style. Yeah. Okay, Oliver, you're up. Um, all right. So let me see. You want to tell us briefly wh wh what's the new position that you're in and a little bit about where you are? Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, can you see this now? Let me just check. We this. do. We do. Right just now? do the play it. Yes. I press the play button, but now you see the whole thing? Not yet. No. I, we still see you in the navigator mode. Okay, it moved to the other side. So sorry, just a second. I will try again. This is not good. You lost it? No, no, it's. Um, I have two screen two monitors. Yeah, wrong screen. So uh, it worked before. So I yeah, don't it know. did when we tried. Uh, Ignacio, if you're with us, can do you have any advice? Yes, uh, just drag the presentation to the screen that you see on blue. Drag the presentation there because you have it on the screen. No, no, you don't see it, right? No, we yeah. Now we do. Yeah, but when I do a presentation, it goes to the other side. It, you know what? It's okay. Uh, we are all honest. We're not going to cheat and look at the left side, if you want. Unless you can fix it, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll try. So, so I'm sorry, Nick, I'm like Peter. I use two very quick cases, but I'm not gonna show too much videos. I have more two things that I learned myself from these cases, which, because all from all these brainstem cases, you always, even if they go very well, you go out and you learn one or two new things. That's very interesting for me. So this is a 32 year old male was operated uh, six months earlier in another hospital, they said they took this complete cover It looked the same way. 
uh, via a retrosic uh, approach out. And then he must have had a rehemorrhage. And so they sent this case to me. And uh, intentionally, I don't show you too many. I can make it a little bigger now. Um, I mean, it's really how to say you can choose where you want to to uh, approach it from. So uh, maybe. What, are, what is the deficit? Uh, maybe oh, that will help us. Really bad. He has a, a, a high um, hemiparesis. He had a swallowing problem. So he had the whole, the whole nine yards, basically. It was really in a bad shape coming to me because he had a re-hemorrhage. So he was not able to walk. Uh, it was very difficult to speak. Uh, Bulberry speech and um, many cranial nerve deficits. So he was really in a bad shape. But he had radiation when he was a child. So it's a typical, he had two more cavernomas in the brainstem. So it was uh, radiation induced, basically. Paolo, what's your recommendation? I'll make it bigger. Well, I do think that we need more slides, and I would go for where it comes to the surface. If it goes laterally, I would go laterally, even from a retro sigmoid. This one you can, if it goes towards the third, the fourth ventricle, I would go through the fourth ventricle. But I think that we, we do have to study very careful all the, the, the images that you have. Okay, Dr. Hongo, can you make a decision yes. with these slices well, or you, you don't have enough information? I think uh, we need to do surgery again. Uh, I prefer going from an uh, proposal or, or lateral. Uh, I like, I prefer an proposal approach. But Dr. Hongo, how I can, I can't show with my mouse, but in the middle picture, suppose Oliver did the tractography and mm -hmm. these were corticospinal tract covering the anterolateral part of the cavernoma. Ah, here. Wouldn't, yeah, well, here and even, you know, spread mm -hmm. more posteriorly. Wouldn't the Kawase approach be the wrong approach? Ah, uh, yeah, you may be right. You may be right. Uh, more laterally. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. Another, <laughs> sorry about, uh, thinking of the cortical spine flux, yes. I think uh, lesion. Well, uh, another, my preferable option is uh, palamedian, spalacerebellar, infratentral approach, uh, to be avoiding the corpus spine flux injury. I think uh, my another option. Uh, any, any of the panelists want to offer an opinion? I mean, I think you're stuck reoperating on it. And I personally would just go retro sigmoid again through the middle surf cerebellar peduncle and try and get in it, get out what you can. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I would go retro sigmoid and often even the big ones, they'll collapse. Uh, I just, I hate the floor, you know, especially one that big, even if you know where the tracks are, you may not be able to avoid them. You, you know, Oliver Watson, I've used it maybe only twice is pre-sigmoid not, not the full combined subtemporal pre-sigmoid, just the pre-sigmoid, uh, because with the cavernoma, you know, as you know, it's not like a big tumor or an AVM. All we need is a right angle. I think I would look more carefully with the pre-op images, but I might do just a pre-sigmoid window to get that exact lateral angle to where I'm imagining it's most, it's nearest the surface. And this way you can angle a little back towards the fourth ventricle. The retrosigmoid, you know, you're, you'll be ending up doing cornering, what I call, you know, you corner like a 90 degree angle, unless you use, of course, the endoscope. But uh, probably that's what I would consider doing. I'm looking at the sagittal and the lesion is mid clivus. So, so it might work out well, pre-sigmoid. Um, For the pre-sigmoid retro labyrinthine, Jacques. Correct. Exactly. And as you know, yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say, I, that's a consideration. It's a narrow window, but I would look, then you maybe look at a CAT scan and look at the temporal bone and see how much yeah. you're really gonna have, because it's not gonna be much potentially. And if you're hurting, you know, you can do a partial translab and still, you know, 
we looked at our series here of partial trans lab. We saved hearing in about 60% of cases with just the partial drilling. Uh, yeah, that might be a better option. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, in that case, it is clearly protruding inside the fourth ventricle, even though, would you avoid that, Bill? Well, why do you say that, Paolo? I'm not sure it's clear to me. I see a thin ribbon of very important brain in the floor no, of the I'm core. sad in that case. I, to make oh, my oh, mind, oh. we need more. We do need way more pictures. I mean, yes, but, but I, uh, I think also in this picture already that there is a there is more than a thin line, and he actually has no facial palsy. He has a lot of deficits, but no facial palsy. So I'm pretty sure I was I was pretty sure that the fourth ventricle is safe, and you would go through the nuclei. So I, I, I'm not a big friend uh, going through the midline or through the fourth ventricle. So uh, I think from the studying of the other colleagues who worked earlier, I think what they did retrosic is they went too far deep and then they wanted to work around the corner. And that's, that's always a big mistake. So they would probably could out take this out and saw the, the empty uh, hole and thought they took the cold carbonoma out, but they could never get this if they come from here. So basically what I chose here in this case was the supercellular, transcellular and transpeduncle approach. So not coming from the peduncle from laterally, coming from above. And you can see this now in, uh, I have to make this smaller, in this intraoperative MRI and you see the, the root basically, sorry, uh, it's not getting smaller. We can see your post, the tract, yeah. And then and, and I could actually get the complete MR, uh, the complete cavernoma out through this approach, which was very, very nice. Um, two things, MRI, post-op MRI, sometimes you have difficulties to see if there's residual or not. I have the same problem, but intraoperative MRI interestingly helps many times to distinguish whether I have a residual or not. So that, that is for me uh, something that I learned with intraoperative MRI and brainstem cavernomas. And the second thing, and I will go to the next slide is that I like the approach through the peduncle, whether you come laterally or above of it, but you really need to clearly um, avoid the superior or the inferior peduncle, because if you really damage that one, then you're in big trouble for the outcome, the rehabilitation outcome of the patient, because the guillain molare triangle, if you damage that, they will never rehab. So I was very close here, as you can see here, and. I always remember then Spetzler saying you really need the far lateral supercellular approach. And since then, I really try to come really from the corner, around the corner. So you went transcortical the whole way, looks like? No, 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 no. Supercellular, and then about two centimeters before the brainstem, I get a little, go a little bit through the cerebellum, and then I go on the top of the peduncle into the, and it goes very well. You, you, mean, you mean because it was too low to do just supracerebellar? That's what you mean? No, exactly. Right. Well, it worked for you, I guess. I, I wouldn't have chosen that, but I, I see what you mean. I think the main message, though, of that is, is if you're going to make that approach through the peduncle, it is okay and better to enter it farther back and have a longer route to it to get a better trajectory. Yeah. Um, that approach going over the top where you essentially enter uh, a little bit of cerebellum and then you come into the crease. You basically go subarachnoid through cerebellum back into a subarachnoid space that fold that um, uh, mesencephalic cerebellum cerebellum uh, sulcus picture. yeah, and then come onto the top of the peduncle or laterally enter the peduncle in that, in that little fissure area that um, Paolo showed so nicely. Um, in between the two folds of cerebellum behind the fifth nerve. But it's better to start farther back and have a longer route through peduncle than, than have the wrong angle. You know, the other thing that this just emphasizes, we haven't talked about it. We've talked about the nuances of, you know, very uh, high-tech monitoring and imaging tractography. But for those in the audience, as you mentioned earlier, Jacques, in other parts of the uh, world where technology is limited, you, you, you can't, you talk about neural navigation and how critical it is to do any of these cases. And it's just not even an option, in my opinion, 
to do any of this stuff unless you have really good neuro navigation that gets you exactly where you want to go uh, for all of these cases. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that might be an interesting question for the panel, which is I would guess 25% of the ones that appear to present to the surface, you see, you clearly see it coming through the surface, you know exactly where to enter. You see a brown blush or something. But a lot of the time, I agree with Nick yeah. completely, which is odd, I admit, yeah. but I agree with him completely that, um, that without navigation, you cannot be confident about where to enter in a large percentage. Which, which, which there must be a, a role for, you know, that good quality, which much cheaper ultrasound, intra-op ultrasound, I guess. The probes, though, are all too big for this area. I've really? never seen one that's small enough for this approach. I remember seeing Ugur Ture present. He used it a lot. And I thought he had like a burr hole size one. You, you think that's still too big, Peter? If it's a burr I, You know, I, I think I've seen it too, but I, I don't know for that approach... I don't know, I guess I, I shouldn't say, but I, I haven't seen one that's quite big. If they're all like 13, 14 millimeters across, which is, it's just too big. I haven't seen one that's four or five, you know, but um, yeah, four millimeters would be great. Yeah. Oliver, you have an, another- yeah, One more case with two other things that we can discuss. So this is a 50 year old male with very mild clinic. He has a very partial, Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, but basically, you cannot see the video. Basically, has difficulties to concentrate on a monitor when he's doing his work because the eyes move too slow and he had trouble. So, that was new for him, and he had some gait disturbance, but that was it. And I'll show you only one picture which shows the cavernoma very well. And, uh, and it comes back to the discussions that we had before for the midline. So, we showed this case and some of you know it from the brainstorm conference. I showed that case already one time and asked you guys what to do. And uh, those who don't know it, uh, Paolo or- uh, I, I don't know it, yeah. Or Jack, what, what would you do? This is the first time he had symptoms. Um, well, I mean, if it looks to be ex in the, this one in the fourth ventricle and if, I usually do uh, fiesta or kiss sequences to really make sure there is no brain matter on it if it's in the fourth. And if I think I convince myself there isn't, this one I would do Tilo Velar because there is no other good way for this one. It's too deep for all the other approaches. Jacques, you would treat this up front? That's the question. Uh, because, because you didn't want to treat the 10-year-old that I presented with progressive sim symptoms. The, the, your 10-year-old was deep. Uh, the lesion was quite deep in the brainstem. Yeah, this but this is right in the fourth ventricle. I mean, this is I mean, this is a disaster waiting to happen, in my opinion. Well, I mean, that's what I'm... If there is any brain on it, I would not treat now. I just... One image I cannot tell. I'm just uh, covering my bases. <laughs> No, no, I hate that. Believe me, I really hate that approach. Uh, so I, I, you know, if it's exo, if I think it's exophytic in the fourth with no brain, sure. I mean, th those do better than where you have to actually make a myelotomy to get to it. Well, Dr. Hongo. Uh, can, I, can I say my opinion? Well, yes. uh, Orbe mentioned the patient. Uh, this is the first attack, right? And not uh, severe enough, then I'd like to see the patient for some time. And then uh, the patient has repeated symptoms. Uh, then I see the, which uh, site region is uh, more bigger. bigger. Uh, definitely I go through the, when you know, surgery indicated the uh, uh, post ventricular flow approach, but not from the midline. Uh, the mm, larger site I go in. Uh, I don't like uh, going midline. That's my opinion. And not, uh, uh, this is not the time of surgery, uh, just the uh, first attack of this uh, grade of the deficit. That's my opinion. Thank you. I, you know, I agree with you, Kazuhiro. In, in that paper of Spetzler and Kalani that you mentioned, those cadaveric dissections, as you know, in the paper, 
they have midline ventral ponds they have there are some of those so-called safe entry zones i would never use they may be safe in a pure anatomical cadaveric specimen where you can use a very thin razor blade and do fiber track dissection like paulo does but in a real clinical setting they are not safe at all i mean, actually i have a talk where i color those orange i don't color them green like the real safe zones you know so the reason why i show this case is because we showed the same case to 100 participants at our brainstem conference and this is the result of it so basically don't look on the students on the left side or non-surgeons but look on the residents and on the surgeons who are trained and who would consider surgery and there you see the blue ones are the ones who would not do surgery after this initial event and the other ones would do surgery but we also wanted to ask them when would you do it would you do it right away would you wait two weeks would you wait longer etc and you see actually among the surgeons who were trained and doing such things it was very heterogeneous when to do it mm -hmm. and a little bit higher on the part who would not do it, but more than the half would do it. So it's, it's a very funny heterogeneous result. Shows you how we all know what we're talking about. Huh? <laughs> there is clear <laughs> evidence. <laughs> and the second question, which makes it funny, uh, very, very easy is then most of the people, of course, said that it would be the suboccipital midline telovelar approach. Okay, so that we also all agreed on. And everybody from these 100 people, most of them who participated. So coming back to that, that what we just published. So the midline ones, what we talked also about, the midline ones are the ones where I think people should be really cautious, maybe think about waiting and not going too fast into surgery because you could damage patients a lot. And the more lateral the lesion goes, I think everybody, want, every one of us, if he sees a lesion like this on the lateral side, it doesn't matter what, is it midbrain, is it uh, uh, pons, or is it medulla? I think we are more uh, ad yeah, adventurous or we want to do more surgery. And on this case, just to finish this up, so I didn't do surgery on him. Uh, a year later, he came back. He said after two months, everything was basically gone. So this is the MRI uh, a year later, which looks like as I resected it, which I didn't. And this was one year more later, you see the little dot of contrast enhancement, which is probably the rest of the cavernoma. The patient was doing perfect. And since then he never showed up again because I told him, if you have no symptoms, uh, you don't have to come. If it bleeds again, you will have symptoms. So and up until today, he is symptom free and he never had surgery and he's very happy. So I don't think I could have done a better job with surgery. That is my opinion, at least. That, that's great. Uh, Oliver, this little DVA in 2018, was it there before or is it appearing now? It was compressed, yeah, but it was there in 2017, yeah. Okay. Well, can't argue with, with this result. Well, I mean, I just we just have to say that I, I have more than half of my patients with brainstem carcinomas are the ones that I follow and don't operate. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody, anybody else? Uh, actually, if, if you stop sharing, let me show some, well, unless I lost, ah, it's okay. I was going to show a case, but I lost my presentation. It doesn't matter. I was going to show what I call the path less, the path less traveled, exactly this point of choosing the far lateral approach through a lot more brain rather than going through the floor of the fourth ventricle um, and kind of to, to break the rule of the two-point method. But we discussed it enough, it's, it's okay. Um, uh, we've covered really the audience questions. Uh, I, it's an open forum. Anybody wants to discuss anything with anybody else? Uh, pa oh, Paolo, uh, so I forgot earlier uh, in, the, in the session, audience members wanted to know if they wanted to see your cadaveric dissections, where are they published in papers, in a textbook? Where, where can they see them? I'm working on that. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. So they'll have to come and visit you then. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
So I'm working on that. We are trying to put everything together and see okay. if we can publish it. Yeah, you should. This is uh, all the amount of effort you've put into doing it. It's beautiful. And, uh, and, I, and I'm sure you can tell the young people in the audience that you really don't understand the anatomy until you do the dissection your, yourself, correct? I mean, is that a fair statement? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is, there is no doubt. From the books, especially this 3D that you have to go through the Excel. You know, because in, in Atlas, what we have from that is a lot of Excel cuts, which you do have to look for the nuclei and then imagine how they are going up and down. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of new publications on that. I and mean, you can find those uh, with Professor Respect's uh, group, uh, with Professor Rotten's group. There is, there is a lot of art uh, beautiful articles on our anatomy uh, with that also. But yeah. they are published in journals. Yeah. Not, yeah. not in Atlas or anything like that. For the audience, I'll put in a plug for the second Rotten Society a virtual meeting, which will be two weekends in a row, a week uh, September like 9, 10, 11, and then 18, 19, 20. Fernand, uh, Juan Carlos Fernan, uh, Miranda will be is running it, and many contributors. And there will be uh, a, a, at least a couple of sessions on brain stem anatomy and surgery and so forth. So I encourage people to look into it. Well, I will let Oliver go to bed. I will let <laughs> Dr. Hongo go, go to, to his work and the rest of us probably mostly to dinner and, and sleeping. Guys, uh, thank you so much. Great session. Thank you very much. Bye thank to the you. audience. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Bye. everyone.